The Board of Trustees at Hampshire College has agreed to divest from six companies because of their involvement in the Israeli occupation of the West Bank and Gaza. Hampshire is believed to be the first U.S. college or university to divest from companies tied to the Israeli military. The board agreed to the divestment following a two-year campaign by the campus group Students for Justice in Palestine. Thirty-two years ago, Hampshire College became the first school to divest from apartheid South Africa. It just sucks. I, I hate guns. Just like... What's the point in holding a fake gun then? Why are you, why are you doing that? I mean, this is, it's part of a kind of like, you know, street performance type thing where we're just trying to simulate vaguely what it might be like to actually be Palestinian and, you know, be living in the territories where there's walls like this and, and checkpoints blocking your movement, your ability to go places, go to the hospital, your job or whatever. So this is, I mean, we tried to make it look, you know, pretty fake, but just to simulate the, the idea of like going somewhere, trying to get somewhere and having not like even a policeman, but a soldier actually come up to you, a soldier with like an M16 come up to you and like demand your identification and have the complete right to search you or even turn you away. So what we've been doing is giving people Israeli or Palestinian passports randomly. And if they have Israeli passports, we let them through and we tell them, you know, if you had gotten a Palestinian passport, you would have been stopped. If we give them, if they get a Palestinian passport, we stop them, we explain to them like what it's like to try and get around in the territories, and then we tell them to go around. <laughs> Some of them just still go through, but... That looks so good. Yeah, wait. I'm Dina Jasser and I came to Hampshire in the fall of 2005. Well, my dad's from Bethlehem, so half my family is Palestinian, half Palestinian. Um, and I wasn't really an activist before college because I didn't know how to be. And I had been to Palestine when I was 10 with my family for the summer. Um, but still didn't like know what the political situation was. And then um, took time off from Hampshire be after my first year because I wasn't sure I wanted to go back. Um, and one of the reasons I wasn't sure I wanted to come back was because I had seen this as a place where a lot of political organizing happened. Um, and then I got here and didn't really find that. Um, so in my semester off I went, I returned to Palestine um, 10 years later and everything just looked so different than I remembered it as a 10 year old. Um, I remember like the, the sights and the sounds and the smells were the same, but we turned, um, I was in a car with a family member and we turned around this block and all of a sudden I realized we were right by my grandparents' house and I had no idea that that's where we were because there was this ginormous like 15, 20 foot tall wall with a watchtower right there blocking um, my field of vision. And so it was just so bizarre to be there again, but the scenery had totally changed because of this giant wall there. My experience of being there when I was 20 and seeing how much things had changed and gotten worse in 10 years um, made me really ready to do something. And, and being there and being able to say, I saw this, and I understand this in a way that I couldn't before. It made me want to come back and organize. And, and then I met Noam when I got here after my time off from Hampshire. And um, having that, having another person who cared a lot and was like willing and ready to, to dedicate energy to, to helping people in the U.S. understand what the occupation was um, also really motivated me. I was born in Israel and lived there most of my life. Just a little bit after I was born was the time of the first Intifada 
uh, I mean, when I was five, that's when the first Intifada started. That was something that I was kind of vaguely aware of, because I live really close to the Green Line, the 1967 border uh, that Israel now controls both sides. Just before having to make the decision of going to the army, that's when the, the second Intifada broke out, and I was becoming disillusioned of this peace process. And that was the time where I decided to, to refuse to serve in the army. You know, I refused, I spent time in prison for refusing. Uh, when I came to Hampshire, it was quite a bunch of years after all this process. So I think that the main sort of impetus for my activism with relation to Palestine um, is the fact that I grew up in a place that was free, open, or so it seemed for people like myself um, to see one's life as free, you know, at the beach in Tel Aviv, and then you drive for 20 minutes and you see living hell. To see the differential, differential treatment and the privileges you gain um, you came to sort of shock my conscience in, a, in the way I think it should shock any conscience. Um, so I was involved for years in this kind of activism, I think over a thousand protests in which 19 people were shot to death. Um, I myself was shot when I was 17 um, by an Israeli border policeman um, during one of those nonviolent protests. Um, but for someone in the U.S., and this is the way I've sort of come to view it for myself, of course, by implicitly by paying taxes, um, we're funding this apartheid system or this occupation. Um, so, like, already materially, you're directly connected to it if you live here. As someone living in the West with all this privilege and all, you know, going to an institution of higher education, at the very least, to actually, like, take up that ethical call in the best way you possibly can and being honest about it, that's, I guess, that's the, the impetus for me. And that connects not just to Palestine, but to, like, the way I interact with people, like, here as, as a, a white person in, like, a racist society, you know, like, that kind of thing. It's every moment there is that there's an ethical call of some sort, and it's just about, do you face up to it, or do you, you know, imagine that it doesn't exist? So I went to Palestine in the summer of 2008, and I went with this group, um, <clears throat> actually it's a program called Birthright Unplugged. It's uh, run and organized by two women, and one of them is a Hampshire alum. And the way it was set up, the time that I went was they were having their first uh, BDS institute, like basically like a conference that they had organized for themselves, like workshops on how to like strategize on different kinds of you know, BDS action that was happening across the country. So that it was cool for that reason. But being in Palestine, um, even I was only there for a couple of weeks, but being there for just those few days, living with Palestinians, meeting them and seeing it, made a couple of things just extremely lucid for me. The first was that um, BDS is literally the only method um, of nonviolent resistance right now. It is the only organic movement that's just brilliant in the fact that it springs right from the soil of Palestine. Um, and that it, it is actually, the, it, it offers like the best conceptual framework of working not for the Palestinians or with them, but just in solidarity with them, um, which is what SJP holds pretty sacrosanct. We consider ourselves um, subordinate to calls that come out of Palestine civil society. Palestinian civil society, over 170 organizations, put out a call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions uh, until Israel is, has met three demands, basically. The state of Israel must stop its illegal um, expansion into the West Bank and uh, must stop its illegal military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. It must recognize the right of returns of Palestinian refugees. It must um, ensure full equality of Palestinian and Arab um, and other minority citizens of Israel proper. At the first meeting of SJP in 2006, I think, um, BDS came up. I think it was Margaret Cerullo was the person that, that said, you know, we should pay attention to this call from civil society. The Students for Justice in Palestine was just forming. It was, it was sort of an idea, I guess, in the minds of Noam and some others. And I went to the first meeting. And Margaret and I made a presentation sort of based on, on a conference that Margaret went to about divestment. And we photocopied, you know, 
bunch of kids and started talking about the investment in that meeting and about uh, a campaign to start a campaign, to start a group. And the students were like, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. This is our first meeting. We're just beginning to come together to get to know one another and to try to think about the issues. And so from that first meeting, it was on the table, but there was sort of a common consensus that there was no way we could push for anything like that without doing a substantial amount of work um, building the group and educating the campus. So we felt like you can't just jump into a boycott divestment sanctions movement when people don't even know what the occupation is. Um, so we felt like we really, really needed an educational campaign on campus, which is what all of the film screenings were about. <laughs> Um, we would like make these zines and things and put them in bathrooms on campus. Um, we just wanted some sort of like basic educational event um, on a regular basis just to get people thinking about it or at least hearing the words occupation and Palestine and like knowing that these were real things. Addressing why is it an occupation? Occupation is not just about having settlements inside Gaza. And it's very important to recognize that Israel still controls all the borders of Gaza. So you might think of it as a very big prison that was established. All the people were locked inside by a certain occupier or prison guard. And then they uh, took the keys, locked everybody in, and just left them there. The consensus of the first meeting was we'd have to do at least a year of education before we could push for something like divestment. Um, but from the very first meeting, there was a, that was, we were talking about that. In subsequent meetings, it became, it became more necessary to, to, to not talk about that specifically because we didn't want to scare people into, um, we didn't want to put all our cards on the table without having built the campaign first and educated the campus. SJP's BDS campaign was built on the foundations of past activism and organizing on campus. From when students of color organized against institutional racism in 2008 to when students organized against South Africa's apartheid regime in the 1970s. Hampshire as an institution of higher education has a sort of mandate, but not only a mandate, but also a responsibility. I, I think that academic institutions have a critical role to play in raising the issues that are precisely the most difficult and unpopular ones to raise. Especially when it declares itself to be a progressive institution aimed at values um, such as liberty and freedom and equality. Hampshire was the first college to uh, divest from South Africa apartheid, so we had this historical legacy to live up to and to build off of. I was actually interviewed for my job at Hampshire on a picket line outside the library where the faculty were all picketing in support of students who'd occupied a building um, in, in calling for the, the college to divest from South Africa. The Committee for the Liberation of Southern Africa is holding an occupation of the first floor of Cole Science Center, the administrative offices of Hampshire College. We have exhausted all the established channels within the system in our divestiture campaign, and we feel it is necessary that a serious and act as occupation be taken. Out of one of the takeovers, which I don't know if you have this, but you should know, the divestment from South Africa came through source students organizing. Source is students of underrepresented cultures and ethnicities on campus. Uh, essentially, it's an umbrella term for the students of color and international students. A, a group of students of color and international students on campus got together and after a buildup of a lot of just racist incidents happening on campus, decided that it was time to have action like big, large-scale, mass organizing action, and we organized uh, a week of teach-ins and uh, workshops and guerrilla theater about issues of racism and oppression on this campus, and gave the administration a list of demands um, that we need, that we asked of them in order to make the college more anti-racist, more anti-oppressive, and at the end of the week. We gave the demands to them on Monday. The next Monday, we held a walkout because those demands were not met. I wish that there had been a more official and consistent and public acknowledgement of the role that Action Awareness Week did play in 
producing a supportive climate for divestment. The specific demands that were about that came out of Action Awareness Week recognized things that were happening within the school that directly needed to be talked about and addressed immediately, but also recognized that the school operates and exists within a larger context and a larger framework that's not just the U.S., but is really, I mean, the whole world. It was our issue. It wasn't our issue. SJP had already been working on it, and it, I think it's felt to a lot of people that it just sort of, like, got lumped in with our stuff. 14, all done. Keeping Hampshire's policy on socially responsive, responsible investing in mind, we demand that the small divest from Israel and dissolve all financial ties that help or support the occupation in any way. In the end, divestment came on the list. I don't know, I just think it was there because of what was there in the past. Like, a lot of Action Awareness Week were about the demands that weren't met. If you look at the list of demands from Dakin Takeover, Coal Science Takeover, and then Action Awareness Week, you'll see more than half of them are the same. And so if you're going to ask for divestment from South Africa, why wouldn't you ask for divestment from Israel? Like, So it's sort of like building, the movement keeps building and building and building upon each other, and I'm very interested to see what happens next. Members of SJP continued their campaign for BDS by using both grassroots organizing and by embedding themselves in the school bureaucracy. SJP made strategic use of elected student positions on the Hampshire Board of Trustees and its subcommittees. The conversation after a while of all the educational stuff turned to having an institutional statement and what kind of a statement can we get at Hampshire as an institution to make? We had an institutional statement which was kind of a core aspect of divestment in general. Um, this was what this institutional statement, which would, was kind of a draft of what we would like the administration to say if we were to divest. And so there was a lot of conversation about should we call for that as the Palestinians called for it, or should we alter it? Divestment from the Israeli occupation, meaning like specific companies that are military that make military equipment to facilitate the occupation. We took the call and modified it for the sort of circumstances of Hampshire, uh, and we wrote an additional passage on the responsibility of Americans in this struggle and this occupation, the responsibility of students. Because of the nature of Hampshire and it being a, a tiny school with like 1,400 students or something, we felt like it could work to really go and individually talk to every person on this campus. Um, so the people who were dedicated to SJP, which was maybe like, you know, 20 core people, um, just decided to have like a constant presence in Saga, the dining hall, um, just like walking around the dorms and stuff to talk to people about our idea for an institutional statement and uh, get people to sign on to it. That took roughly a year, after which we entered sort of several stages of negotiation with the Board of Trustees, in which we presented a case for it. And he said, look, Hampshire has a history of being socially responsible. The companies we have located in Hampshire's investment portfolios were precisely in violation of all what we just said, those policies of responsible investment. The trustees, uh, sitting on the trustees was a very interesting experience. Uh, how they dealt with the issue of Palestine or uh, SJP um, was just, it, it felt mostly as like, oh, okay, the students are bringing something to us. Uh, we're dealing with this again. This thing happens every spring, you know, there's yeah, a student issue. You could feel that they were just, they thought they were never really going to have to deal with it. The decision to divest from the State Street Mutual Fund, the one asset that SJP identified as complicit in the occupation, had been formed in a subcommittee of the Board of Trustees with the help of student representatives who are also SJP members. At the Board's first meeting of 2009, the recommendation to divest was ratified, the no accompanying statement on Palestine was released by the school. The school instead cites a general policy on socially responsible investing as the rationale for selling shares in that fund. Jay and Brian were very, very excited and text messaged me and basically said they had great news and then told us that this had been accepted. And we were ecstatic because we had worked so, so hard for this. Um, 
but we didn't understand understand exactly what it meant. Once it became clear that the Board of Trustees were not going to uh, make a statement alongside us, I personally approached Ralph Hexter and said, you know, listen, like, we are going to, we're going to announce this. We can announce this together in some way that, that makes sense for both of us, or um, or it can just be us. But like, you know, you know we're going to have to go out with this. Um, and he didn't seem interested, or he said he wasn't interested. So, you know, I think that, I mean, that's where the backlash from the administration came in the first place, because I think they somehow perceived that this event would go quietly, they just divest, and it would be maybe maybe not people would know exactly the reasons why i don't know why they thought that because we were a pretty loud group on campus free free palestine 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 as students of any of the five colleges we know our colleges or universities are invested and we must demand action now it is possible and absolutely necessary that we call for accountability on the parts of our institutions for the oppression that they perpetuate. Thanks everybody for coming, uh, and thanks for everybody from all the communities who helped organize this, and let's stay and let's talk and let's figure out where to go from here and how to keep this going. We did decide at a certain point that, you know, we can't rely on the administration. Like the administration, if we get caught up in their uh, concerns, this won't go anywhere. What we need to do is we need to claim victory um, and be proud of what we've done. and run with it basically and we literally just took a week and I mean I'm telling you every single night and during the days for hours at a time um, just making it happen really like I said deciding what are we going to do with this how are we going to present it you know getting together thousands of journalists information writing press releases preparing to both hit it up into the larger world but also on campus and so I mean that took like an incredible amount of work a dispute has emerged between officials at Hampshire College and student organizers over the school's recent decision to divest from a mutual fund run by State Street Global Advisors. Activists with the group Students for Justice in Palestine said the move came after it had pressured Hampshire's Board of Trustees to divest from six companies that provide the Israeli military with equipment and services in the occupied West Bank and Gaza. Hampshire College officials admit they reviewed the State Street Fund after receiving a petition from the group, but the school said the divestment decision, quote, did not pertain to a political movement or single out businesses active in a specific region or country. Well, that article came out, and I remember handing it out to different people. I remember thinking this is going to be huge. I remember giving it to SJP members and having them run around the school and like point to this and say, look at, look at what's happened, look at this, this is such a historic thing, and I felt so good. And then this email came out, and it was the only thing that the administration had done, and it wasn't even directed specifically at me. I had never been contacted by the administration, but this email, this letter of clarification came out saying that, you may have heard that we have divested for these reasons, but we haven't. And you may have heard that we have, um, you know, divested specifically from these six companies, and we haven't. And I read that email and just thought, man, I totally messed this one up. And as soon as that happened, then, you know, I got some support from SJP members saying, like, no, don't worry, like, th these are like lies, these aren't really what's happening. And I, I felt totally lost. Did Hampshire divest? And you could ask that question is, was divestment like a success? And yeah, like an, it was a huge success in that um, this campaign went through. There's been a lot of support. As far as I know, um, Hampshire is so far the first college to divest. There were those on the um, Board of Trustees at Hampshire itself who said, no, no, we didn't invest for that, re divest for that reason. The fact of the matter is that before February 7th, we were invested in the occupation. Today, we are not. Uh, now, how did the college administration characterize the divestment? Well, yes, uh, recently the, the college has tried to itself a bit from uh, you know the political implications of divestment uh, saying that the decision to divest uh, wasn't necessarily linked to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict 
it's a symbolic act. And I mean, while it is a symbol, and while we did, re while the act of divestment from the occupation of Palestine totally did reach like a very, um, a very active audience and inspire them, um, it did not, uh, it did not reach into a wider, um, like a wider mediatic presence. And that's, that's because of the way the administration reacted. Um, so in that way, um, if you ask your average American, like whoever, if Hampshire College divested from uh, the occupation of Palestine, they'll be like, what the hell are you talking about? So, um, but of course this is just the beginning. This week we divested. The thing is the administration is pretending that there's they're basically pretending that it's not because of SJP pressure when that is actually the reason that we're divesting from the Israeli occupation. And, you know, it doesn't even matter. I mean, what we're trying to do is reach out to other students and build a movement and make it possible for other schools to divest. We're not trying to prove that the administration is happy about it. Um, we're just trying to show that it's possible through organization and through student pressure. So we got the school to divest from those companies that were benefiting from the legal Israeli occupation. The school administration never made a statement uh, that the occupation is bad or whatever. But the school administration is not the school. The school is everyone who goes, the staff, the students, the community at large. And those are the people who made a statement by organizing a movement by getting this movement to succeed and by getting the, uh, the, uh, the school's finances out of the occupation. And that's what matters because the administration is not the school. They're one contingent of it. Without the students, without the staff, without the faculty, there would be no school. There would just be a bureaucracy. So, uh, uh, no, we didn't get the administration to make a statement. They buckled to outside pressure. Um, uh, uh, but the school, in terms of the community, made a statement. Hey, what hey, is Ryan. Why is tonight more important than any other night? Because tonight we're having a vigil to commemorate um, basically all of the people who have died this week. Over 110 Palestinians massacred within, two, within 48 hours this week in Gaza. Um, and then also today there was um, a shooting in a school in Jerusalem where a Palestinian killed eight children and, or not, we don't know if they were children, but killed eight people and wounded seven more. So this is just um, in solidarity with all victims of the occupation, both Palestinian and Israeli. A BDS program has two, two goals. The one is to modify policy, but the other is to educate people so that others come along and learn something and start doing something themselves. Well, you want to educate people, you direct attention to what we're doing. And in this case, the uh, student campaign at Hampshire, I thought was very well crafted. It was crafted just the way it ought to be. At U.S. actions, U.S. corporations participating in criminal acts 
in the occupied territories, and it's calling on Hampshire to refrain from participating in